The roughest calls we get as 911 operators are when it's a kid at a local school making a bomb threat or saying they're going to shoot somebody. Nine times out of ten, these calls are just pranks and it winds up with a teen getting a stern talking to and then suspended from the school for a few days. I wasn't having a great day already before the call, so when I got it and there wasn't any tracking info, I assumed it was a prank before the conversation even started. What is your emergency? I asked without opening up my desktop. I admit it, I wasn't alert of the danger. I'm in a school, and, and someone here is trying to kill me and my classmates, the timid voice told me. I thought I heard laughter in the background. Alright, and what's the name of the school you're at? I asked, leaning forward to grab a bagel from my snack drawer. My attention was a million miles away. I don't know, they admitted. I tried my best to roll my eyes. You don't know? Well, how did you get to the school? I asked. I woke up here. I think I was drugged. The school looks mostly abandoned, they said. And you just happened to find a working phone? I said skeptically. Their story wasn't adding up. I found it from the corpse of our teacher. They tried to fight back and whoever is holding us here killed them, the kid told me. Your teacher was kidnapped too? I asked. Yes, please, can you send help? They asked. I typed up the notes and told them to describe their surroundings. All I know is that I'm in a gymnasium and the windows and doors are all blocked. Like I said, the school looks so old. Dust and cobwebs everywhere, they told me. I asked for a name and they told me Will. I decided since the day was pretty slow, I was going to play along and asked Will if he could get outside the gym. Only to the basement. I snuck out to use the restroom and make this call. I'm worried if that psycho finds out I have this phone, he will... Hold. Wait, someone is coming, they replied. I paused for a second as I heard bathroom door shuffling. At first, I assumed it was just a teacher coming to find out why this kid was taking so long in the bathroom. Then I heard what sounded like a scuffle. The phone dropped and I heard something like a scream. Suddenly, I wasn't sure this was a prank anymore, but I didn't act yet. There have been plenty of times kids have gone much farther than this to get a good laugh. The phone line went silent for a few moments and I dared to call out to Will. Then a new voice, an older male, picked up the phone. Everything is fine, officers. We'll just manage to sneak into my teacher's desk and nab my phone. My fault for not paying attention and not keeping it locked, they said. But something deep down told me that I couldn't just let it slide. Just for our documents, we're going to need a little more information before you go, sir, I said. I wanted to sound like I had the authority to come and break their doors down, but truthfully, I didn't have a clue where they even were. Certainly. This is Mr. Brown. I'm a substitute over at the elementary today. Last days of school are so hectic, they said. Then they hung up the phone. I chewed on my pen trying to decide if I believed their answer. I got up and went to the recording room and asked if they could play the audio back. We haven't had much chance to review things today. Is it urgent, Tom? My coworker asked. I told them the situation and they pulled the tapes, all of us trying to determine the location that Will was talking about. Might be the old high school, across the river? My supervisor asked. Just to be safe, we sent dispatch to the elementary as well. I waited to hear something from the dispatch, hoping that my first guess about this being a prank was correct. I didn't want kids to get hurt. The first elementary told us that everything was fine, but there were no substitutes today. Same went for the two other grade schools in this area. We hit the high school last. I called dispatch and listened as they raided the old building. This place is so creepy, Tom. Literally no one here, they said. I was a little relieved, but also frustrated. The prank had been intricate, and once again, our resources were wasted. Hold on. I think there's a basement, the dispatch said. I held my breath. Then I heard an explosion. I dropped the phone and grabbed my hair, trying to not panic. Had my coworker just died? The emergency line called again. What is your emergency? I said, trying to sound calm. I was so eager to call dispatch and make sure everything was okay. Hello? It's Will again. I know where I am. What? The old school? Did a bomb go off? I asked. No, nothing like that happened here. I was wrong about it being a school. It's a theater. 
and they just killed one of my friends. I called another patrol officer to give the information and told Will I had to switch him to a different operator. I was unable to focus as I realized the old school was a trap. When I got in touch with the dispatchers there, they gave the bad news. The basement had been laced with explosives. Two of my colleagues were dead. A pit was forming in my stomach as I heard over the walkie-talkie that dispatch was getting to the theater where Will claimed they were being held. A dark thought raced through my head. Does that property have a basement? I asked. Yeah, the blueprint says it does. You think the kids are down there? No, I think it's a trap. This place will blow if anyone goes downstairs, I said. There was a bit of an argument about what to do when Will called again. Hey, uh, is your team coming? Another one of my friends got shot. Will's tone was different. He sounded older. Can I talk to your teacher? The person holding you hostage? I asked. No, he doesn't know I got this phone again. I'm on the roof. I can see the water tower. I think that I'm by the old railroad, they told me. And I think you're lying. You've sent my team to two different locations and nearly killed them all, I said evenly. No, please. You have to help me, Will said. It was bizarre how weird he changed his tone. Will, can you do me a favor and turn up the volume on your phone? I asked. I listened and then hung up and ran to the audio room. Enhance the final 10 seconds, I told them. We heard airplanes, and I knew instantly that Will and his friends were there. I called dispatch to get away from the theater. Thankfully, they didn't trigger the explosion. We all held our breath as they reached the airport. At first, there was nothing to be found. Then, dispatch reported that there was a bus sitting there, with the driver and teacher dead. Oh God, and where are the kids? I asked desperately. They stormed the warehouses next. They found one of the children tied up next to an old World War II jet plane. I tried to stop them. I told them this was too far, they said. I was listening to the conversation, but I didn't understand what it meant. Who is doing all of this? I heard the patrol officer ask. Will! He's been trying to kill all of us and everyone that he can! I heard gunfire in the distance. Will was making his last stand. I heard them shout for him to stand down, but that didn't happen. It was clear he wanted the cops to take him down. When the dust cleared, they found out that he had taken his class hostage and planted several explosives around town, all because he felt he was ignored. We spent the rest of the week finding the explosives. The notes we found on his laptop claimed there were five around town. We only ever found four, and that terrifies me the most. My neighbors keep calling 911 on me. At first when it happened, my wife and I admittedly were in the middle of a heated argument. Nothing serious, we weren't threatening each other or anything, but when the two first responders showed up to see if everything was okay, you can bet I was embarrassed. Meredith, my wife, was honestly more concerned that we would be fined by the city for causing disorder in the neighborhood than the person that called 911. Apparently, we were the problem here, not them. The police gave us a stern lecture to keep our volume down while we worked out our problems. Apparently there's a noise ordinance that we didn't know about. Meredith and I politely and calmly agreed we would listen. And as soon as the police were gone, my wife told me I needed to figure out which one of our neighbors had an issue with our little tirade. I mean, by that time, we had forgotten what the argument was even about. Now we had a mutual enemy. This neighbor that apparently thought we were causing a disturbance to the peace of our community. It didn't take a rocket scientist to realize it was probably the ones right next door. We hadn't been that loud, so the quaint brick house with the 1970s architecture told me that our neighbors were likely an older couple that believed any loud outburst was a reason to call the police. I knocked on the door, remained polite, and introduced myself. We had just moved in only a month prior and didn't really know anyone yet. I really appreciated your concern earlier, but it wasn't necessary to call 911. Everything is fine. We are fine. The man I talked to called himself Arthur, and apparently, he and his wife Betsy were babysitting their youngest grandson, Eli. Arthur's attitude implied to me that he felt we were a nuisance, and I wasn't entirely sure my calm demeanor would change his mind. And it didn't. Less than two weeks later, I was on my way out the door to work when I was stopped by another officer who told me they got another call about us. There's apparently been a report someone was using a firearm nearby, the officer asked. I realized Arthur was calling it in out of spite again. 
I apologized as much as I could get out of a ticket and marched over to have a talk with my neighbor. Next time, please before you call 911, just call me instead and we can handle it decently, I told him. This time, he feigned innocence and said his wife did it. I urged him to pass the message along to her, but that didn't happen. Instead, a week later, there was yet another instance where 911 was called and thought there was a problem. I can't even remember what their issue was, to be honest, and this time I tried to reason with the officers and tell them I was being harassed. I pay my taxes, I keep my yard clean, I don't have any problems with any other neighbors, just them, I said. Of course they said I should go downtown to file an official report, but I doubted that would put a stop to this behavior. The next time I saw Betsy, I confronted her and asked why they were constantly calling 911. Look, I get that we started off on the wrong foot here. I guess we could have been better neighbors. But what you're doing is downright awful. If you don't stop, I will file a complaint, I told her. This time, she blamed her husband, claiming she knew nothing about it. I hated the fact they were merely passing blame back and forth between each other. Then one afternoon, I saw Eli coming out of the garage to toss trash away, and I decided maybe the best way to resolve this issue was just being friendly. Visiting your grandparents again? I asked pleasantly. He was there quite a lot. He darted his eyes and raced back inside, not bothering to reply. His odd behavior puzzled me, and I asked Meredith if she had ever seen Eli's parents. I just assume that the old couple takes care of him. Maybe something terrible happened to them, and those folks are all he has left now, Meredith told me. The next time I saw him, I knew the first thing I wanted to ask was about the 911 calls. Your grandparents have been pestering us a lot. I'm not sure what their goal is, but if it continues, they could get in a lot of trouble, I warned. That did the trick because his eyes got big and worried and he admitted he was the one that called 911. Each and every time, he claimed it was just out of boredom and since he looked so frightened, I didn't lecture him. I figured that since I had solved this mystery, that meant Eli would stop pulling this prank. Just to be sure though, when I saw Arthur the next day, I apologized. You might want to give that grandson of yours a stern talk though. 911 isn't a children's toy. The old man seemed genuinely surprised that it was Eli and promised me he would take care of it. I didn't get any more phone calls or unexpected visits from the police after that, and for a while I thought that was a good thing until Meredith pointed out the obvious. Ever since you complained about Eli, I haven't seen him, she said. I paid more attention to our neighbors after that for the next few days and realized she was right. Eli was nowhere to be seen. I told myself that there were a variety of reasons why Eli wasn't out or visible, but none of them made sense. Finally, I did something I didn't expect I would do and actually called 911 on Arthur and Betsy. It was bizarre, given our rocky relationship, but I am so glad I did. I watched from our front window as the police asked them questions and then proceeded to search the house. The old couple had been lying again because about five minutes later, I saw them putting Eli out on a stretcher. His whole face was bruises from where it was obvious he had been struck. I gasped and ran outside to get in a hurry to ask questions. I wasn't sure I wanted answers. Eli had tried to off himself, officers claimed, and apparently he had been the one calling 911 all those times. It had been a cry for help from a young boy that didn't want to get caught by his grandparents. Arthur and Betsy beat him, starved him, and apparently they were only keeping him for the money that they got from child support. Police even suspected that the two were responsible for the death of Eli's parents. I went to visit him in the hospital, glad to see that he was recovering. He apologized a lot, something I'm guessing that he did a lot for his grandparents. I told him it was fine, but maybe next time to try and get help for himself rather than pulling pranks. I had confidence that the doctors and nurses would handle taking care of Eli while I returned home to make sure the neighbors were taken care of too. On the way home, I got a call from dispatch. For some reason, Meredith was calling 911, they told me. Apparently, the report said that she was being threatened by our neighbors with a firearm. We aren't planning to come this time since there's no threat, the dispatcher told me. As soon as I heard that, I sped home. When I found her dead inside the house with a gunshot to the head, she was still gasping for breath. I tried to call 911 at least 10 times, but they recognized the number. They didn't believe this was anything besides self-harm. They didn't come, and I lost everything.